let me begin on purgatorio, which is a word meaning a place of cleansing. Purification. Um, and this is the middle section of the poem, literally a place of transition between uh, the, the world of hell and, and, and all the evil that we have witnessed, and then the, the, the realm of glory, which is going to be paradise. Um, uh, let me say a few things about purgatory, both as an idea and uh, as, as uh, a poetic construction, Dante's poetic construction. Um, as an idea, uh, the way Dante understands it, uh, purgatory is part of uh, human geography. As you know, it's uh, located in the southern hemisphere. There are two hemispheres in medieval geography. The northern hemisphere, which is the one we inhabit, and then there is the southern hemisphere. Uh, the, and, and purgatory is an island. I have it tried to explain to you <coughs> last time the origin of this place. It's uh, in Dante's mythopoeic uh, uh, thinking. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's an island that emerged from uh, the northern hemisphere at the time of Lucifer's fall. Uh, the earth trembles and retreats, that's the idea, uh, as Lucifer approaches and, and thus it creates the void which becomes Hades, the abyss, and the island and the, the purgatory emerges on the other side, the southern hemisphere. At the top of the purgatory, there is the island of, there is the, the, the peak, there is the Garden of Eden. There where God placed Adam and Eve. So that uh, from this point of view, purgatory is part of human geography, but it's historically inaccessible to human beings. One hero that already we, we already met, Ulysses, in Inferno 26 tries to approach an island and retrospectively we can understand that that was uh, the island of purgatory, this is a place of immortality that Ulysses wanted to reach and uh, could not. That journey of his ended in shipwreck and tragically. Uh, Inferno 26 is the text for that kind of uh, concern. The other trait about uh, purgatory, a moral trait, uh, since this is now uh, we are going to enter the realm of reconstruction of the human. And this also makes sense that Dante should place it immediately after hell. It, it is as if only by knowing, only by experiencing, more or less, as metaphorically as we can, through the poetry of Dante, the nature of evil and the horror of it, can we begin to have an appreciation of, uh, of the good, the good toward which uh, now the pilgrim is uh, going to climb. The other, the other thing that you should keep in mind about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, Purgatory and the difficulties that the poet will have uh, is the following. Uh, the perception of moral life and political life in Purgatory was so satanic, so narrow, so terrible, that Dante is going to have a lot of, quite a, quite a, quite a challenge to try to explain the, the usefulness and, and, the, and the possibility of reconstructing a moral world and a political world. He, was, he came very close to a total rejection of, uh, of the historical world and the political world. And now he has to find out how that reconstruction is going to be possible. The way he will do this is literally to go back to the natural world. Do not expect Dante to imagine a place where there is some kind of redemptive intervention from the outside that can tell us this is the way you do it. No, no, the natural world, a world, the natural world must be capable of producing within itself some, at least contain some seeds for a need to reconstruct, for a need for the good. So this is going to be part of uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, strategy and his difficulties. A further trait of purgatory, which was really completely missing in Inferno. In Inferno, we had never had a sense of time. Time was uh, the biological clock of the pilgrim, who was the only living creature, the only truly displaced figure. And he is the only displaced figure 
throughout the poem. In Purgatory, who will find further their old displaced figures. So it's a more human uh, world. Uh, but here now they have the sense of time. In fact, the first thing that we, we, we come to understand is how, what time is. It's time understood as future oriented, as a projection in some kind of future. And at the same time, this idea of time also turns out to be a return to the past. So that as the pilgrim is going ahead, he really discovers that he's going backwards to the Garden of Eden, exactly there where Adam and Eve were placed at the top of purgatory by, by, by God at the time. I mean, the story that you have in, uh, in Genesis, uh, uh, for instance. But this idea of time, uh, this will become truly a leitmotif throughout purgatory, the idea of what is the relationship between the past and, and the future, since the only real time is really the future. In, from that uh, uh, point of view, which makes you understand that even the past was the future, at some point at least, right? So the future is the only thing that Dante is going to be interested in, and the future will come, and the possibility of a future, and the way it's related to the past, will become uh, uh, the object of uh, his concerns, the object of his thinking. Uh, openly as he goes through the various, uh, 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 the various ledges of purgatory. Poetically, the purgatory is divided into two, to two, to three parts, I would say, actually. The, the first part is the so-called anti-purgatory, made of souls who are waiting, uh, they're not really penitents yet, but waiting to be assigned a particular place along the uh, ledges, and then the so-called penitents who are going through the process of cleansing, beginning with pride and ending up with, uh, ending with lechery at, uh, just before the pilgrim gets into the Garden of Eden. The ordering of sins is the exact reversal of the ordering of sins you had in Inferno. Here you begin with a spiritual sin or intellectual sin, the question of pride, and end up with uh, the most physical and material of them all, lechery, which as you rec recall, is uh, the, the inverted image of what happened in, uh, in Inferno, right? With the, the Lucifer and the sin of Lucifer being really a sin of, uh, of pride at the end uh, of uh, Canto 34. The, well, having said this, uh, maybe other things will come to mind as I go on uh, 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 today. And let me begin with, uh, uh, with uh, some other couple of details as I just uh, get into, plunge into the, the Canto 1. Where, are, where is the pilgrim now? The poem, the journey began on uh, Good Thursday, as it's called, right? That Dante spends the first night, but the journey, the real journey begins on Good Friday in a clear imitation of uh, uh, Christ's uh, harrowing of hell and emergence into the light on uh, Easter Sunday. That's where we are now, Easter Sunday morning. If the inferno begins at dusk, and therefore uh, the, the, with the, uh, the idea of the approaching night, the night that stands for the unknowability of uh, whatever he's going to confront. Uh, Dante is fascinated with the idea of the night throughout uh, inferno. Imagine, remember uh, Ulysses who travels following the sun and then the, and, and, and ends up really gazing uh, at the night, the unknowability of his destiny, the unknowability of the place even where he is. Now we begin with dawn, uh, and therefore Canto I of Purgatorio becomes that which in Provencal literature is called an obad, or, or from the word ob, uh, alba in Italian, A-U-B-A-D-E, the, the song, the, the dawn song, uh, a song that in many ways reverses uh, the grand uh, tradition of uh, the erotic lyrics of, uh, of uh, Provencal uh, well, poetry, uh, where the dawn becomes the unhappy time for the parting of lovers, and here now it's regained as the great time when finally uh, uh, the pilgrim can go on and the poet can go on mapping, uh, literally now mapping the journey, sailing through or ascending as the metaphor that he asks, uh, that he, he, he adopts uh, can be. In the poem, the second part of the poem, Purgatorio begins, first of all, with an image of water, and, 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 and therefore it, it carries further this motif of the cleansing and purification, but really with a better metaphor from our point of view, to course over better waters. The little bark of my wind now lifts her sails, leaving behind her 
so cruel is he and I will sing of that second kingdom where the human spirit is purged and becomes fit to ascend to heaven but here let poetry rise again from the dead O oh, holy muses since I am yours and here let Calliope rise up for a while and accompany my song with that strain which smote the ears of the wretched pies so that they despaired of pardon. It's an extraordinary poem uh, to, to Purgatorio for a number of reasons. First of all, Dante picks up the metaphor of the, 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 the epic topos, the epic metaphor of, uh, of, uh, uh, the, the, of, of the journey uh, with which the poem began in the middle of the journey of our life, as you recall. But now this, uh, uh, this, this, this idea of the process is indicated with uh, Redor sailing, therefore literally recalling the, the, the sea voyage of uh, Ulysses. That's, that's one, an oblique metaphor. But I want to draw your attention to the use of this uh, adjective, a comparative adjective. That's what we call it in grammar, as you recall, the, you know, the better. Uh, this is Dante's emphasis exactly on the, the process and then the, com com the comparatively good. This is not the best of waters. It's not the worst of waters. This is the better waters. We are really in the, on the way to, uh, to better things. It's a, it's a world of degree uh, that Dante introduces. This, uh, Dante really believes in a, in a sort of hierarchy, in a hierarchy of... Uh, of, of values, of state, of, uh, of powers, of, uh, of beauty, of intellect. The world cannot be, uh, it's never a, dua, a, a, a dualistic world between what's bad and what's good. There's a lot of mediations, mediating steps along the way. And now he already introduces this, uh, this, this whole question with the notion of the better waters, the little bathroom. Which is, this is not only a journey. The interesting thing is this is a journey of poetry. It is as if Dante now wants to highlight a motif which is going to be very crucial throughout the poem and in our reading of this poem. That my, the reading of this poem, and I have been addressing this issue to some of your questions, that there really is no sharp, no drastic discontinuity between the, ju the journey of the pilgrim and the journey of the poet, right? That the journey of the poet is an extension. It in itself is a journey. It in itself is a journey of knowledge and the journey of discovery. Dante, Dante makes uh, uh, large claims for poetry. Poetry is a way of knowing. It's just not a, a, an ornamentation or a commemoration of the past. Now here, he talks about the journey as being the journey of poet, the little bark of my wit. It's a conventional way of thinking about the bark of poetry with which he is. So this, there seems to be a, a way of saying this is now more, at this stage at least, he wants to us to think about the journey of poetry and not just the journey uh, that he himself will use, uh, will, 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 will undertake the journey of the pilgrim, the hard, difficult journey uh, filled with fear. Uh, that, uh, that he uh, was experiencing in, uh, in, in Inferno. But I also want to draw your attention to another little detail of the text, which is that it, the first time now that Dante will use the future tense, I will sing. We are in a world open to futurity. And if it's open to futurity, the only way of thinking about futurity is, is made possible by a belief in the new. You have to, you cannot really think, yes, you can think of the future, but if the future is exactly as, as, as it is today, then you really have no future. Then you really think that all is released into the domain of sameness. You know, if my, my day today is exactly what I, more the, the, the world that I, that I experienced yesterday, there's no new, no idea of the new. And Dante instead here now uses the future and clearly implying that there is an alternative, a different a possibility of doing things in ways that have not been done before. This is going to be a new departure, a new departure for thought, a new departure for the imagination. And now he says it has to be also a new departure for uh, poetry itself. I emphasize this idea of the future, I will sing. The first time that he was, he wasn't saying this in Inferno, of course. He couldn't even say that in the Vita Nuova. You remember that I pointed out when we were reading that little autobiographical great text, 
called the, the Vita Nuova, the beginning of the term, I indicated to you that, that there is never the future tense used in that, in, that, uh, in that text. It was all a book of memory with the difficulties and the dangers of memory. The dangers of memory being that memory changes, can draw us into a world of phantasms. That's one of the, it, it's not a rejection of memory, only a way of highlighting its possible dangers, right? Uh, and the belief that unless you live with some idea of danger, maybe we are not really thinking uh, hard enough. So here now it's the, the, the only time that the future was used in the Vita Nuova was either in the idea of death, Dante has a prophetic <coughs> dream and uh, he hears a voice that he perceives as a kind of so, so, so truth laden is that voice that he thinks of it as a kind of, uh, of prophecy, as a sort of, of oracle speaking to him, you too will die, Beatrice has just died. And then the death of Beatrice brings to his mind the fear and threat of mortality to him, you too will die. That's the way the future is going to be understood. But then the poem, the whole uh, Vita Nuova ends with a statement of hope. I hope to work and write things whereby I can say, I can write, I can say things about, uh, about Beatrice that had never been said about any woman. And so that becomes uh, the two possibilities of the future. The only, literally, once grammatically, it's the future tense, and the other one with, through this uh, periphrastic construction, through this oblique construction about the hope the verb use of the hope uh, in, in, uh, with the idea of the future indicated there. And then, uh, but here let poetry rise again from the dead. Uh, and the prayer to the muses, very much in the style of the epic tradition, and especially of the muses to one, the muse of the epic poetry, Calliope. But then this, the, the focus on Calliope will really tell you something about the kind of uh, uh, I think retrospectively really explains, but let here dead poetry rise uh, again from the dead. Uh, the poem presents itself as Calliope was the mother of whom? Anybody remember? You remember your mythology? Okay. No, you don't now, but it's, it's the mother of Orpheus. So that dead, let dead poetry rise again, uh, let dead poetry rise again from the dead. It's Dante presents himself as if he were a Norfolk poet. He is not a Norfolk poet, but a, a poet in the tradition of Orpheus who wants to conquer death. That's clearly enough for him. That's, that's what the Orpheus descent into the underworld really is, the way of conquering death. The belief that poetry can do the trick, that through poetry we immortalize ourselves. We conquer death. He's going very soon to to, to, uh, to understand that that's not the way he is going to do that. And then something, a second paragraph, I want to read it a little bit because it, it really gives you a, a, a different um, sense of the, the tonality of Purgatorio. Because it's not only you have now mourning and time, you also have, for the first time, light. Not the sort of uh, spectacular uh, shades of light, the blue, the reds, uh, uh, the green with which he experiences and dramatizes paradise according to the lights emanating from the various planets, the red of Mars, the white of Jupiter, the blue of Saturn. And so there is a kind of polychronic uh, uh, palette that is going to be deployed. Uh, here it's now a more human and natural world, the natural world. And listen to this, and this enables me to say something else about the traits of Purgatorio, the sweet hue of the oriental sapphire, which was gathering the serene face of the heavens from the clear zenith to the first circle, gladdened my eyes again as soon as I passed out of the dead air which had afflicted my eyes and breast. A fair planet that prompts to love Venus, you know, the morning, uh, the morning uh, uh, star, that love made all the east laugh, veiling the fishes which were in her trains. I turned to the right, Remember that I, I sort of tried to explain to you that with one exception that I can't explain, nobody can explain, and only very few people have noticed, uh, the, the uh, Dante now is turning to the right, which is to say that even while going down, spiraling down in the world of hell, he actually was going to the right, though he said that he was going to the left. But he was going to the left because he was upside down. Now he's right side up, and so the directions of the human world are going to be 
uh, to be regained. So I turned to the right, he will never use this image again, and set my mind on the other pole. And I saw four stars never seen before, but by the first people, Adam and Eve. The sky seemed to rejoice in the flames, all widowed regions of the north, since thou art denied that sight. The, the, the northern hemisphere is where we are. Dante is in the southern hemisphere. He is connecting with us, telling us what we are deprived of in, by not knowing, by having lost uh, paradise. Uh, a couple of things that I will not, since Dante will, will go back to these images, um, the, the way he literally orients himself. The, le the, the, the metaphor he uses is that of uh, here uh, is the oriental light. Uh, and the way he's always orienting and reorienting himself, he, how do you know where you are, is now in, in Purgatory and also in Paradise when thinking about, about uh, uh, characters uh, here on earth and, 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 and recalling their life, it's always by looking at the East. It's always by looking in the light of the East. And, and from this point of view, Dante really retrieves that most incredible metaphor that is available among the mystics, medieval mystics, and I'm thinking, or thinkers, I'm thinking of even Boethius, Cassiodorus, I hope they're not just names for you, who think, who, who believe that you can only think that we in the West, a Western life, can only think by looking toward the East. That the way in which we can be orienting ourselves is by trying to capture that the source of that light. And I, I mean this in the most metaphorical and, as we shall see, the widest senses uh, possible. But that's all he's saying now. But at the same time, in the language, it's incredibly hard to shift between the first paragraph and the second paragraph. That which seems to be the excitement for the light that now he's experiencing again, it's Easter Sunday. He, un he understands the resurrection. This is going to hit him very, very strongly now. Uh, but it's also an elegiac. The tonality is elegiac. The idea of what we have lost, the widowed region of, uh, of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the, sense of, uh, the sense of general loss, though it's a provisional privilege for him to see all this. But this indicates and introduces that the, 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 the extraordinary tension, poetic tension in Purgatory, the dialectic between excitement for the future and the analogy for the past. The pilgrim is caught in between, and we shall see the consequences between. This is still at the level of, of, of tonality, I would call it, but we shall see what this really means in, uh, in a moment. As Dante approaches now, um, I have drawn my gra grace and so on. Uh, this is lines uh, uh, 25, when I had withdrawn my gaze from them, turning to the stars, turning a little toward the other pole, where the wind had already disappeared, I saw beside me an old man alone, worthy by his looks of so great reverence that no son owes more to a father. His beard was long and stretched with white, and his hair, the same, a double tress falling on his breast, etc. This is going to be the encounter with Cato. And I want to talk about Cato. Why? Let me just give you a little bit of uh, extra uh, Dantesque information. I mean, in a way, this is, you probably do not know, that this representation, we call it uh, the, this, this uh, descriptio of the old man with, uh, the, the, uh, with a beard or white streak with white, but on two sides, really is the, the paradigm, the model uh, that uh, Michelangelo writes. Uh, Michelangelo follows in his uh, conception of Moses, though Dante doesn't lose sight of the fact that this is Cato, just a little piece of uh, how Michelangelo read, Michelangelo read uh, this particular, particular meeting. So who is this Cato that Dante describes as an old man? And we also know that he's a Roman, he's a pagan. In fact, he's not only a pagan, he's a man of laws. The first thing that he wonders, and he says, paragraph, who are you that have fled? You, you, these, these, are, these are just uh, 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 people who have tried to literally escape uh, from prison, the, the eternal prison against the bright screen, he said. 
who has guided you or who was your lantern in coming forth from the profound night that holds in the perpetual blackness the valley of hell? Are the laws of the abyss, very Roman, this is the Roman tradition of the law, right? Are the laws of the abyss, in a way it's a man who's a stranger to the world of purgatory. He certainly doesn't seem to understand that there have been, may have been some grace. That maybe Dante and his guide are here out of some providential intervention, which has not, not to be explained by laws or by natural or by the laws of nature or by man-made man laws. Are the laws of the beast as broken or has a new decree, he wonders, been made in heaven uh, that being damned you come to my cliffs. My leader, Virgil, the two Romans talk now, I'm of myself, uh, then I answered him, I'm sorry, uh, then I answered him, of myself I came not. A lady, Beatrice, recapitulation of Inferno 1, descended from heaven for whose prayers I succored this man with my companionship. But since it is thy will to have it made more plain, how in truth it stands with us, it cannot be mine to deny thee. This man never saw his last hour, but by his folly was so near to it that little time was left to run. I was sent to him and have shown him all the guilty rays and no purpose to show him those spirits that cleanse themselves under thy charge. How I have led him would be long to tell thee. There descends from above virtue which aids me in bringing him to see there and to hear thee. May it please thee to be gracious to his coming. He goes seeking liberty, which is so dear, so dear as he knows who gives his life for it. And the reference is clearly to Cato himself, who historically, historical figure, actually committed suicide uh, in the Civil War and refusing to take sides between uh, Pompey and, uh, uh, and, and Caesar. Uh, as is told in the great epic by Lucan, the Roman Spanish poet who wrote the so-called Civil War, uh, a text that is uh, uh, very polemical between, in between, other thi among other things, uh, with, with, with Virgil. Thou knowest it, since death for it was no bitter to thee in Utica, in North Africa, where thou didst leave the vesture, the body, in which, um, in which, which in the great day will be so bright. The eternal edicts are not broken for us, for this man lives and minus does not bind me, but I'm of the circle, limbo, where are the chaste eyes of the, thy Marsha, his wife, who in her looks still praise thee, O holy breast, that thou hold her for thine own. For her love, then, do thou incline to us. Allow us to go through thy seven kingdoms. I will report to her thy kindness, if thou deign to be spoken of there below. And he responds, Marsha, so pleased my eyes. While I was younger, he said then, that whatever kindness she sought of me, I did. Now that she dwells beyond the evil stream, she cannot move me more by the law which was made when I came forth from thence. But if a lady, etc., etc., um, it just is an amazing, um, from in substantial terms, an amazing beginning in the poem, because Dante meets uh, Cato, whom he defines, told there that he's an old man, a pagan, and a suicide. There are traits that Virgil singles out, obliquely referring to his adventures, and that clearly contradict the world of purgatory. The world of purgatory is a Christian canticle. This is Easter Sunday. Why have it inaugurated by the presence of a pagan who knew nothing of the, of, of the incarnation? Why have it, it's the, it's the, it's the realm of uh, a renewed life. Why start it with a suicide? Someone who, we saw what Dante thought of the suicide, when in, a, in a complicated way throughout Inferno, there were a number of suicides inhabiting various aspects of uh, various uh, uh, regions of hell, but especially among the, uh, with the violence against nature in Inferno 13. And so an old man, a suicide and a pagan, why does he do? A figure that he draws out of the the world of uh, of Lucan, 
Um, what we are told about him is it's a, uh, usually whenever you have representations of the beyond, you always have a young man, for the Eubenes. This is a kind of the Latin term meaning a young. Uh, in Alain de Lille, for instance, there's always a young man or a young woman welcoming the, to indicate the, the renewed life, you know, the novelty, the freshness of a life. Uh, you certainly don't have uh, an old man and you certainly do not have a suicide. Now, the question of the suicide is probably the easiest to, to determine. Because Cato's suicide is a suicide for freedom. And let me say a couple of things about freedom because it's, um, I call purgatory really the, um, the domain of freedom. It's really the place of freedom. That he begins here explaining, as it, it were, a political but also moral state. It's a political because it's, 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 it's a refusal of the disarray and chaos brought in by the war between Pompey, brought in by the war between Pompey and Caesar at the time of the Civil War. But it is also a moral state because Cato decides to put an end to his life in a sort of sacrificial move, as if to draw attention to the, 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 the way in which the state had been uh, killed, had been destroyed by the rivalry between these two, uh, these two great figures who have not opposed, but have a rivalry about power. But freedom is the fundamental problem. It's a Roman issue, as we just say. Dante wants us to think of it at, at, at the very beginning of Purgatorio in pagan intellectual terms. Freedom. Uh, the, whole po the whole Purgatory ends up with the pilgrim regaining and being crowned, as he'll say, with the attainment of free will. So the whole poem really moves. This idea of um, uh, uh, Cato's search for freedom, quest for freedom, and the pilgrim attainment of free will. Now, there is an obvious relationship to begin with between freedom uh, on the one hand and, and uh, I would say, the future on the other, right? Uh, the poem begins with the future, and now we are going to be said what, are the, what is a virtue of the future. You cannot conceive of freedom unless you have an idea of the future. You cannot conceive, you understand the, the connection between the two? You cannot conceive of a novelty unless you have an idea of the future and unless you have an idea of freedom. The notion of originality is actually, an, even poetic originality, is impossible unless it's tied to a certain idea of freedom. It presupposes them all. So that the attainment of freedom really means a poetic originality, idea of the future, the notion that things can be different. If I am a slave to the past, if I'm a slave to a political order, if I'm a slave to my own vices, internal, as internalized as that quest can be, then I really have no freedom. Cato embodies one who refuses living, if living means living in a state of tyranny to uh, civil war, violence, and therefore to the impossibility of a moral life. Okay, so that's easy to determine, that's easy to explain. Uh, I even think that the notion of the old man uh, can be explained. Dante wants to draw our attention, first of all, that somehow this search for the future, <laughs> he's, it's, it's not, not an alternative to the past. It grows out of the past. So that we, we, he's rejecting the idea that there may be some sharp distinction between the two and that the seeds of the future are already contained in the past, a figure such as an old man, uh, Cato. The third problem is the question of his being a pagan. And this brings me back to that which is the project, Dante's project in, uh, in Purgatorio. The project is that there is, he must make a careful distinction, which St. Augustine could not make in the city of God. Dante will make it. That's, his, that's Dante's uh, target, polemical target. Augustine really distinguishes between the earthly city and the heavenly city. And the heavenly city may live on earth, but it's really a pilgrim church going on toward, uh, toward the beatitude and the encounter with God. The earthly city is corrupt and in many ways uh, not assimilable to the, the world of, uh, of the redemption. This is, this is made, if you are, are an Augustinians and you have a very subtle view of Augustine, it may strike you as crude, but I don't think that it really, it really 
uh, violates the essence of that dual idea between the earthly city and the heavenly city. Dante is literally talking against the Augustinian dualism. There is in nature, there is within the uh, pagan, secular, historical world, there are seeds that can become crucial for the making of the political, for the making of a new moral life that will be really consonant with, not dissonant with, in accord with the redemption and the Christian redemption that he will be actually seeking. Keep this very much in mind. A sign of this incredible tension, time, the meaning of freedom, the value of the pagan world, the insistence on the secular as, as uh, capable of producing some kind of uh, seed for the future, uh, emerges really in the second paragraph when finally uh, Virgil to bend uh, to the, the harshness, to temper the harshness of Cato says, look, uh, let us go through, because I know your wife, very Italian, I know your wife and I'm going to go very back that is to say, you know, uh, I know who you are, so do me a favor, because I'll be doing her a favor. Let me go and Marsha, let Marsha, I will go there and they'll tell her what a great man uh, you are, what a good man you are. What he's doing, he's appealing to Cato's affective memory. And it is an appeal, it's a solicitation that Cato refuses. She can do nothing for me. He refuses to be determined by the past. You see the ambiguities that are running through. Dante understands that you have to go somehow. The poet in the figuration understands that you cannot really have a sense of the future without being rooted in the past. And then here now you have Cato who can only make sharp distinctions. She can do nothing about me. Now I could tell you that this is a very, the appeal to Marcia, the appeal to Marcia's memory for, for Cato can become also uh, it's, it's, it's full of ironies, and I, I, I will only tell you, I, I, we can, it will take us too, too far afield, I can tell you that in effect, in the history of Cato, Marcia had left Cato, had asked Cato to divorce her because she wanted to marry uh, somebody else. And at the death of the other, the other husband, Marcia asks Cato to take her back, and she will. And Dante is, recounts, Dante recounts this whole story in the banquet and views it as a sign of the extraordinary generosity of this man. So the, 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 there is all of that lore in the, in the background of this reference to Cato. But from our point of view then, it is a question of the power of, uh, the power of memory and the limits, and the limits of memory. And then finally, um, uh, the, he will go on saying, uh, giving some, uh, Cato will go on uh, giving uh, some, some uh, uh, rules that he has to follow in the process of cleansing. You go and wash yourself from the stain of inferno, he will tell him, and gird your loins. They will be there. Uh, he will mention, go to the desert shore, uh, therefore uh, go and, uh, uh, this is the last paragraph, the dawn, here is the dawn song, was overcoming the morning breeze which fled before it so that I described far off the trembling of the sea. We made our way over the lonely plain like one who returns to the road he has lost and till he finds it seems to himself to go in vain. When we were at a part where the dew resists the sun and being in shade is little dispersed, my master gently laid both hands outspread on the grass. I therefore, aware of his purpose, reached toward him my tear-stained cheeks. That's the uh, ritual of purification, uh, which he, the pilgrim, must undergo, and on them he wholly restored the color which hell had hidden in me. We came then on the desert shore that never saw men sail its waters, who after had experience of return. Whom are you supposed to overhear here? What is the reference to? Anybody? Absolutely, absolutely. He makes it very clear that Cato and Ulysses are the two pagans there is a difference, he intrudes, he insinuates a, a distinction be within the body of pagan culture. Ulysses on the one hand, and his own transgressive search for knowledge, in the belief that really there is no knowledge without transgression, which is, which is considerable and, and, and worth, would be worth considering. And on the other hand, uh, the, the, the experience of Cato himself. Now we are, we are here with a different a different pagan. There he girded me as the other had bitten, 
that's a phrase that comes straight out of, of Inferno 26, or marvel, for as the lonely plant he chose, such did it spring up again immediately in the place where he had plucked it. So Dante has to gird himself the way journeymen would whenever they undertake a journey in antiquity. You know, whether it is the biblical journeyman or the Romans, they, they gird, they, they put this girdle around themselves. Uh, they, they, they gird their loins. It's, it's, a st it's, it's a moment of containment of, of self, right? And, that, and that's the ritual he has to, to undergo. Uh, from our point of view, though, the emphasis falls on the power of the natural world to restore itself. Because immediately, and it's an emblem of the resurrection here now, but it's still, we're still in the natural world. There is no, no element of grace. Nature, the, the, the plant, in an inversion of what had happened in Inferno 13, uh, the plant is, uh, is, rises again, is born again. And now we come to Kento 2. Uh, the, the, the situation changes somewhat, but uh, let me just begin. Another point of, uh, it starts with another search for orientation. And I mean that in, uh, it's an easy pun. The East, the Orient, and orientation for the pilgrim. And now it becomes more clearly Jerusalem. And we'll see the reason why it's going to be Jerusalem in a moment. Well, one reason why, let me just say it immediately, because it has nothing to do with the, it has to do more with the, let's say, the myth rather than with the text, is that hell and uh, that purgatory is at the antipodes of Jerusalem, uh, against the feet of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was known as the, 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 the navel of the earth, and now we are in, its, uh, in purgatory uh, at its antipodes. And so it starts, already the sun had reached the horizon whose meridian circle covers Jerusalem. So Jerusalem will become the point of reference with its highest point and night, circling opposite it, were issuing from the Ganges with the scales, which fall from her hand, when she exceeds the day, etc. I was white a rosy cheek of fair aurora, with her increasing age were turning orange. We were still beside the sea, like those that ponder on the road, who go in heart and in body linger. An extraordinary image of this location, of being both being body and mind and aware of a break between the two who have expectations and hopes of moving ahead, and yet they are kept in place by the heaviness of the body. And lo, as on the approach of morning, Mars glows ruddy uh, through the thick vapors low in the west over the ocean floor, so appeared to me, may I see it again, a light coming so swiftly over the sea that no flight could make it match its speed. Uh, and here he sees a boat, a fast boat, bringing, carrying the souls of uh, penitents who are reaching the banks of purgatory. Uh, the very opposite of what we saw with Charon's boat in hell, the boat of, uh, you remember, of, of the sinful uh, souls. Uh, and then an angel of God and so on. Then, as the divine bird came toward us more and more, he appeared brighter so that my eyes could not bear lines 38. I cast them down. Uh, and he came on the shore with a vessel so swift and light that the water took in nothing of it. On the poop stood the heavenly steersman, such as the blessedness that seemed written upon him, and more than a thousand spirits sat within. And they sing a psalm. In Exodus, Israel, the Egyptian psalm, according to the Vulgate, 113. It's a psalm in which um, the Jews are remembering their exodus from the bondage, the slavery in Egypt to the um, to Jerusalem. Okay, that's really the story. This book of Exodus in Exodus is the Egypt. Do you understand retrospectively the reference to Jerusalem? That gives a kind of unity to this whole canto. It's a song. It's a song that uh, uh, a, num uh, a number of things about it. The, o the, the only text that Dante cites, textually cites, he make, make uh, references to the Bible all the time, but the only text of the Bible that Dante really cites literally and takes from textually is always the Book of Psalms. 
probably an acknowledgement that it's poetry uh, and, and that he responds to that poetry. But especially he does so, not only because it's the, probably the text where for the first time we have, we have a, a representation of subjectivity in Western, Western context. It's the story of someone who is looking inward and finding out the, the, the diseases of, of, of self, the appetites, the passions, etc. That may be one reason since he's engaged in that kind of, uh, he himself a pilgrimage engaged in that sort of quest. But there is another reason, I believe. The Psalms are basically lyrical recapitulations of the story of Exodus. So that Dante is saying that Exodus is the figure, that the Divine Comedy is the lyrical representation of the story, the biblical story of Exodus. That he too, that this human history is engaged in that search, a search from slavery to liberty. So let me just pursue this a little bit from another point of view. In Canto I of Purgatorio, we saw the representation of Roman political moral liberty. Now we have an idea that the whole of history is really engaged in this exodus, a journey toward liberty. Two types of liberties, a Roman one and a Jewish one, which Dante wants to connect. It is as if he understands that there are two traditions, both of which are based on a quest for liberty. That there is a sense of, in both of them, though in different ways, a sense of beginning that he must try to harmonize. He must try to explore and probe in depth. What do they mean and what are they about? In one, a kind of legal idea, uh, moral, political idea of liberty, Cato that comes to the point of self-destruction. And the other one, the question of spiritual exodus. By the way, a second thing I can say about this reference to uh, the, this uh, Psalm 113 is that Dante uses it as the basis for explaining his use of allegory. You remember that I spoke about the allegory of poets and the allegory of theologians, and that the difference was the historical basis of the narrative. The story of Exodus for Dante is historically uh, true. It's an event. So this gives a kind of biblical, figural aura to Dante's representation, allegorical representation at least. Uh, uh, and the third thing I have to say is that the story of Exodus in many ways um, embodies, um, crystallizes the real intellectual issues of Purgatory. What is the story of Exodus about? Of course leaving behind the house of bondage, as they call it, the house of bondage, uh, the taking along the gold of the Egyptians, which really means the secular knowledge. The secular knowledge is also part of what we must carry with us in the journey toward freedom. That's, that's it, it. But it also means that they stay in the desert, the Jews stay in the desert for 40 days. They feel that they're abandoned by Moses who has come up to receive the tables of the law. And while they're abandoned, they engage in idolatry. This is the story of Exodus, the story of a people caught between idolatry and revelation and promises, and prophetic promises, prophecy and idolatry. And the idolatry shows itself as a statement or as an experience of nostalgia. That's what the, the making of the golden calf a statement, a way of, you know, desperate as they may be because they are now leaderless, and they will be for a while, then uh, they engage in uh, uh, an act of uh, desire, a longing for at least the safety of what they perceive as the safety of their dwelling in Egypt, mindless of the fact that they were in bondage. It is as if safety, the safety of living, were preferable to them even in, uh, if that is a safety uh, uh, provided, procured, and in the shadow of, uh, of tyranny, of bondage. So you see, this is a, these are the concerns that Dante will have as he comes in Purgatorio. The whole of Purgatorio is literally a journey of way of looking back and forth between the future and the past. And the future and the past are rivaling with each other for the control of the mind of uh, the pilgrim. Let's see how this is going to be uh, developed. Uh, and I hope I have time to um, uh, go give you time for 
for, for questions because I, I'm, I'm really, I realize I'm saying a lot of things and a lot of things I, I'm not even saying. The poem, the canto, shifts from this grand historical concerns, this reflections on how uh, the pagan world experiences beginnings and new departures only with an ideology of freedom and this idea, biblical idea of, of a new beginning, which is really a, a break with uh, slavery, a break and the retrieval of the idea of, of, uh, of freedom in uh, a general and a historical way. Now it shifts, the narrative shifts, and in, it's, it's all internalized. The pilgrim moves within himself. And the first statement is that he does not know where he is. And that's an emphasis, this to say, a way of alluding to this exilic, exilic predicament he has. He literally has, he does not know where to go. He already had indicated this, that his state of mind was that, as that, that of one who with the mind keeps going towards some place, but with the body he's kept behind. Remember that line? which clearly dramatizes the split with a kind of inner self-dislocation for the pilgrim. And now he just is you know, meeting this penitent soul, souls who are as lost as he is uh, about the place. And they all ask him for directions, which, which, which well, they are singing in exit with, they're in the desert. The desert, to be in the desert? <laughs> where is the desert? The desert is where one is. The desert, if you don't know which way to go, the desert is the unmapped space between Egypt, typologically speaking, and Jerusalem. It's some space in between. They have no roots, you have no paths, there are no carvings and markers left for you. And so they ask him, you, can you, uh, line six and following, if you know, show us the way to go up the mountain. And Virgil answers, you think perhaps we are acquainted with these places. We are strangers. That's what it means to be an exile. And that's what it means to write this poetry of exile that Dante will write. This purgatorio is the place of the desert, the, the, the spirituality even of the desert, and certainly the statement of the exilic condition. We really don't belong here. We are always displaced and going somewhere else. And the and the and, and at the basis of Dante's own religious longing. There is the sense of displacement. There is a sense that we are, we are somehow out of, that our hearts are out of where they should be. We came but now, a little while before you, by another road which was so rough and hard that another climb will seem to us as a pastime. The souls who had perceived from my breathing that I was still in life turned pale with wonder. And as to a messenger who bears an olive branch, the people crowd to hear the news, and no one heeds a crush. So every one of these fortunate souls fixed his eyes on my face as if forgetting to go and make themselves fair. Now he, Dante, becomes the object of temptation for the penitent souls. They should be going somewhere. They should be going up the mountain, and yet they stop where they are. So another, another way of thinking about forgetfulness and, and the sense of, uh, of, of, of a name, of, of a place to, to reach. Let's see how this is developed. I uh, saw so one of them come forward with so many, so much affection to embrace me that it moved me to do the same. All oh, empty shades, except in semblance. Three times I clasped my hands behind him, and this often brought them back to my breast. Wonder, I think, was painted in my looks, at which the shade smiled and drew back, and I, following him, pressed forward. Gently he bade me stand, then I knew who it was, and begged me that he would stay a little and profit me. This little detail of the embrace, the failed embrace, is one of the three failed embraces. A way of acknowledging to the pilgrim and us acknowledge that they really, the souls here have no substantiality that we can grasp. Okay. Um, this is the first, and there will be two more that I will talk about as we proceed. He answered, even as I love thee, my mortal flesh, so do I love thee. Uh, Freed. Therefore I stay. But thou, why are thou on this journey? My Casella. Dante meets a friend of his youth, a musician, a musician who probably had even 
set to music, Dante's own poem, a man from Siena, he clearly has died. So it's, it's uh, uh, to relieve the hardship of the journey, uh, this is apparent, an a, mo a moment of indulgence, uh, a way of a meeting with uh, a friend, a little pastoral interlude, if you wish, uh, to break up the, uh, the hardness of the desert and, and the implications of, of that metaphor. The world of not the quest, but now the pause, the pause of, of reflection, the pause of relief, the aesthetic relief that this can give him. My casella to return at a time, why are you uh, uh, take this road? But from thee, how has so much time been taken? He said, no wrong is done me, uh, etc. He explains how he got here. And I, if a new law does not take from the memory or practice of the songs of love, which used to quiet all my longings. Uh, that's a, that, that cl this clearly is a reflection on the power of aesthetics and on the limits of aesthetics. May it please thee to refresh my soul with them for a while, which is so spent coming here with my body. And so Casella starts singing a song, which is a poem that Dante himself wrote. And now he sets it to music, as he probably may have done in this life. Love that discourses to me in my mind, he began then so sweetly, the sweetness sounds within me still. And here sweetness is to be understood as the attribute of musical harmony. I know that sweetness, and I indicated this when talking about the, the gluttonous, it's, it's, it's always the language of, uh, of, of the palate, and, and uh, the savoring, a certain savoring that goes on with the gluttons. Here it's really a musical attribute. It's this, the quality of the sound. Uh, and uh, my master and I and these people who were with him seemed to say as content as if nothing else touched the mind of any. We were all rapt and attentive to his notes. When lo, Cato, the venerable old man crying, what is this laggard spirits? What negligence? What delay is this? Haste to the mountain to strip you of the sloth that allows not God to manifest to you. Uh, okay, so here is an aesthetic, the, the, uh, an, an aesthetic enclosure. Uh, the poet listens to his own song with a little touch of narcissistic temptation. There his casella is playing up to him, reassuring him, giving him a sense that this is you and I know who you are and they're all wrapped and they forget about the ascent. And then, of course, Cato comes, the ethical voice, the voice of the law. So you may have a kind of, you may even want to write about this scene as, as a sort of conflict between aesthetics and ethics. How are they working against each other? But one thing is clear here, that Dante is forgetful of the real lesson that he had learned in the encounter with Cato. It has just happened that Cato himself, therefore he intervenes and his anger is, is the anger of the teacher. He says, but I just explained to you what the, the problems are. Cato, Virgil had approached Cato hope and had hoped that Cato could be swayed by the memory of the past. And Cato had rejected the power of that memory. He, of the, the affection or even, and the pleasure of that memory. Dante comes in Canto too, and he's involved in Let's call it even an idolatrous moment, the moment where he just witnesses something that he has been making, uh, that he has built, he has composed, is taken in by it, but essentially it, that has the power to distract him from his own ascent. He has forgotten the reasons why he is here in Purgatory. And so the whole of Purgatory begins with the, the explicit statement about the importance of new beginnings, new departures, the recognition that everything new and the future can only come out of some sense of the past, and then the discovery that the past can interfere, can intrude, and therefore the steady process of a continuous quest, a continuous rethinking uh, opens up in front of the pilgrim and in front of us. Um, and the, the interesting thing, and, the, and here I stop, Cato uses one word. What kind of negligence is this? And you know what the word means, negligence. We're all negligent. What are we when we are negligent? What does, that, what does the word contain? It's 
can say we're talking about the beginnings, we're talking about etymology, which is the language of beginnings. Negligence means not to choose. But Cato is reproaching Dante and his guide and all the other souls is reproaching the power of poetry to produce this atmosphere of non-choice. Uh, and obliquely, that's then what his ethics is, that we are always engaged in an act of choice. He speaks from the perspective of freedom, which literature, or the, the poetic text that Dante wrote, has the power to tame and somehow, for a moment at least here, neutralize. So you see the, the extraordinary degree of self-reflection and self-reflexiveness of Dante from all points of view. And let me stop and see if there are questions and I hope to be able to answer some of these uh, um, elements in the introduction of Purgatory. Yes. The bark of wit, it's called in English. Yes. The question is, uh, the metaphor at the beginning of Purgatorio, when the, the, the poet says that he's leaving behind uh, such a cruel sea, uh, that cruel sea seems to be, and is actually, we can agree easily, a reference to, to Inferno. But then the question is, can it be also a reference to past epic uh, uh, traditions? Uh, uh, it could be, but you would have to be a little bit more specific about what you mean. You mean the Odyssey, for instance, or the Aeneid? Uh, uh, journeys by sea. Dante is, the, the Divine Comedy is constantly imbricated with these other um, poems. Uh, and in fact, uh, the great poem uh, that he recalls, a past epic tradition, is Lucan. Uh, and he chooses Lucan because Lucan is, uh, so I'm coming back to your, qu your, your question and trying to, trying to welcome it and say that indeed uh, it, it's possible but I have to explain why I think it's possible. The uh, Lucan's Pharsalia is a unique text epi in the epic tradition because it deliberately places itself as a historical, a historical work. The polemic of Lucan toward Virgil is that Virgil, sure, he had been talking, was talking about the foundation of Rome, and for the Romans there's nothing more historical than that, as you know. The Romans had a few so some practical people that will count, will, 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 will calculate history from the foundation of the city. There's never a scheme about the Garden of Eden or Bede uh, who starts writing about uh, unknown uh, events in the past or whatever. Uh, the Romans start with the foundation of the city, Livy. Uh, the so uh, Virgil writes about the origin of Rome, and from that point of view, he's a historical author. But he, he mixes his historical accounts with so much myth-making that Lucan rejects that form of poetry. And he writes an epic about the Civil War. Lucan uh, writes about Caesar and Pompey, which clearly is a way of adumbrating another more pressing civil war, that between Antony and Augustus, and, 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 and alluding to the one between Sulla and, and Marius, the whole sequel of civil wars that had punctuated and, and given its, uh, uh, its, its, its the quality, uh, the, 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 the distinctiveness of, uh, of Roman, uh, Roman history. So uh, in a way, I would say that Dante is rejecting a certain type of ep epic poetry uh, that deals with uh, some kind of generalized uh, metaphorical accounts Though, for instance, he's, he's, he's going to be Jason, he's going to be Aeneas. Now, we have to keep that in mind. It would be a turn to, uh, at, at least in Canto One, a turn to the historical world, a way of making purgatory part of history, because that's really the secret of purgatory. Purgatory, I began by saying it's part of human geography, you remember? 
but not of human history. Dante wants to make it part of human history. We really can go back to the Garden of Eden, if not directly through some reconstruction and, and shadowy uh, refiguration, something that looks like the well-being of the Garden of Eden, something like a, not really utopia, but something can approach the order of the Garden of Eden. I must have confused you with this, this answer. And if so, oh good, thank you. Well, of course not, but no, I think that I was going five different directions and I, and I apologize if I did. Yes? Great question. The question is that I was, uh, I began by talking today about uh, the journey of poetry and really ended with the idea of the danger of poetry, that, uh, that aesthetic self-confrontation that, uh, that the poet Dante has with a poet of his own youth. Uh, so what gives about this tension? Since I'm talking about a tension between two modes of poetry, I claim on the one hand that poetry is for Dante the, a way of knowing and then he uh, seems to get in the way. A scandal, in a sense, a scandal. It really stumbles, makes, us, makes him stumble. Uh, so uh, what is this, uh, the connection uh, between these two, uh, these two forms? Uh, yeah, that is, that is a really great question. I, I think that Dante understands that, uh, first of all, let me just give him a, a great deal of credit. By the time Dante writes, poetry, was still by and large a little game that the Provencal poets were playing in the courts of Provence and Northern Italy. Were little games about secret love stories, little games about hunting, etc. Or the great poems uh, of uh, the so-called uh, Goliards, the gluttonous ones, the, wor the belly worship. Dante comes along and says, no, this vernacular poetry can really become the medium for knowing everything, everything that we can, humanly can, about ourselves, about God, and about all, all the things that we, can, we believe in and the things that we would like to believe in, all the hopes and, and defeats that we have. So that's the great idea of what it means. And so if from that point of view, Dante engages poetry within the circle of knowledge, or what I call the encyclopedic compass of knowledge. So he involves all the sciences, but at the same time, that you ask me to think about that dialectic. One is not conceivable without the, the other. In order to really know, the first thing that poetry has to do is show that it knows itself. Usually, the, the, way, the, the reason why poetry is, is, is treated as a, as a lowly art, you know, the, the, because it is meretricious, it, doesn't, uh, it gives itself to everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm saying all of this because the scene of Canto II really recalls a great scene. We, we haven't got time to go into that. It recalls another great scene, and I think that Dante is really rethinking um, the famous opening scene of Boethius, The Consolation of Philosophy, which I don't know if you have read, but I have mentioned it, but you will. You look like someone who would go to the library now and pick up the beer. It's, it's, really, it's really a book. No, it's, no, I'm serious. It's really a book where the philosopher is sick in bed. He is, he does not know he's diseased. In order to find comfort, he picks up a book of poetry. The muses go to him, pick up a book of poetry, which probably is what most people will do if they got the flu. It's time to read good poetry, right? And then all of a sudden, lady philosophy appears and banishes his muses. Get the hands, you harlots, he calls them, of the theater. Because you don't give any real remedy. You just only provide provision of solace. So, what Dante is doing is, so the whole of the Boethius is philosophy is really better than, than poetry. A way of recasting the old Platonic quarrel, as, as we know from even the Republic, right? Between the debate between poetry and, 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 and philosophy. What Dante is doing is, no, no. Uh, poetry may have these dangerous temptations and possibilities, but that's what makes it part of its own self-knowledge. 
I want to show. I cannot guarantee or promise that poetry will lead you to knowledge unless I show that the medium that I use knows itself. It, it knows its own uh, temptations. It's known, it knows its own meretricious uh, possibilities. You see what I'm saying? It always a come one. You said you, you, you want me to highlight the reasons of that dialectic, that tension, and that the only answer that I can give is that one flanks the other constantly. So that the voice of Cato and the voice of Casella there, at the same time, they belong, necessarily belong together in uh, the, the unfolding, in the articulation of Dante's own uh, voice. This is, you know, you cannot expect to have one, uh, well then, if this is really dangerous, can I have something else? No, no, it's not either or. It's both and. The either or, the ethical or the aesthetic and the ethical, uh, as if there were two opposed forms, just will not do. Okay? Other questions? I wish we had another hour here so that I could really talk about some of these uh, details uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the report. Well, since I hear none, uh, no other questions, thank you. See you next time.